This podcast is brought to you by the Islamic Center and NYU. For more information, visit our website at www.icnyu.org. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa bihi nasta'in. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina wa Nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala al-Tayyibin al-Tahirin. Qala Allah al-Azim fi muhakam kitabah al-Kareem wa al-Qawluk al-Haq wa al-Astaq wa al-Qailin. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إنا بلوناهم كما بلونا أصحاب الجنة إذ أقسموا لا يسرمونها مصبين ولا يستثنون أمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم. First of all, before I begin with our reflection on the set of verses from Surah Al-Qalam this week, which will be part number six, if I'm not mistaken, in our series. On the tafsir of this particular chapter of the whole Quran, chapter number 68. That'd be important for me, first of all, to wish you all Eid Mubarak and reflect a little bit in regards to the story of Nabi Allah Ibrahim alayhi salam before we get into another really important anecdote uh, that is mentioned within the whole Quran for today's discussion. And in order to sort of combine the two pieces or the two dimensions of our conversation this evening, When we talk about the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam and that which makes the day of Eid al-Adha so unique, we reflect upon the submission of Ibrahim, on the sincerity of Ibrahim, and the fact that he was ready to entrust all of his affairs to Allah azza wa jal. And during that process, Ibrahim alayhi salam also demonstrates this unique sense of sincerity with his creator. Again, in this demonstrative, sort of devotional way from a very young age, demonstrating to God how committed that he was to his cause. Of course, it's the responsibility of all of the prophets of God to bring their communities out of darkness and into light. As God states within the whole Quran, هو الذي بأث في الأميين رسولا منهم يتلو عليهم آياته ويذكيهم ويؤلمهم الكتاب والحكمة It's the responsibility of the prophets of God to train their communities, to teach them about God, to take them out of the despair and into the mercy and into the beauty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's by teaching them, by advising them, by warning them, by sometimes reprimanding them. But that does not mean that their lives are easy because they're supported by God, but rather Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also elevates their station by putting them through specific trials and through specific tribulations and through specific examinations. And for Ibrahim السلام, from a very young age, he had to go through just that. A couple of examples. Amongst those examples is in his youth with his uncle or with his father, as was mentioned within the whole Quran. In this particular episode, We know that it was really difficult for Ibrahim السلام, to virtually speak truth to authority, speak truth to power. And thus gradually from a very young age, he developed the skills toward connecting with his community, speaking with them in ways that he was hoping that would open up their intellects a little bit. He would go to their festivals, go toward their celebrations and look at their idols and say, do you not talk? Ala tantiqoon? He would ask them, do you not eat? In order to get others to think about and realize that their deity is someone without any power until like we know he strikes down those idols. And his community, they despise him and wish to take his life as they cast him into a massive fire. But of course, he's saved by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his own conviction and sincerity in his mission. As he gets older and as he ages, Ibrahim السلام, was unable to have a son, but still with his dua and with his supplication remained committed in a state, and in a state of servitude to his creator, thus Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa bashirnahum bi ghulamin halim. He gives him the gift of this forbearing son of his known as Ismail. And Ismail, of course, grows up in his adolescence toward being someone who was by the side of his father consistently. To that extent, when that Ibrahim السلام, goes to his son and tells him that I saw in a dream that I have to slaughter you in the 
that he responds, said, Tajiduni insha'Allah min as sabreen that you will find me amongst the patient ones if you decide to do that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructed you to do. In fact, if I'm not Umar, do exactly that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded you to do. He was also in a state of contentment because of the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that emanates from his heart. But again, look at the ap- episode and the trial for Ibrahim alayhi salam. To be in that state where you have to slaughter your own son is not something easy. It's not something simple. Even, a, even for a prophet of God, it's stressful, it's difficult, it's challenging because again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he puts even his most beloved creations through trials and tribulations in a way to elevate their status and in a way to demonstrate to us that this life is darul bala wa darul intihan. This life is a world of tribulations and a world of examinations. We go through ups and downs during the course of our lives. And through these episodes and through these anecdotes, the anecdote of Ibrahim and others, we're able again to open up these intellects of ours and begin to realize and recognize that we also are not saved from being tried. And that's just amongst the nature and the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his creation. And I say all of this as an introduction to also transition it into our discussion for this week, inshallah, which may continue over to next week due to the length of this anecdote as mentioned within the whole Quran beginning in chapter seven, uh, 68, verse number 17, Surah Al-Qalam, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala presents one of the first anecdotes as mentioned within the whole Quran. In fact, some commentators will state that because of how early Surah Al-Qalam was revealed, and we mentioned that in the very first discussion, that this is one of the earliest chapters revealed toward the Messenger Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam, that this may have been the very first story that God gives us within the whole Quran. And I will say this about stories, sort of as a you know prerequisite to us understanding the wisdoms that we extract from this lesson, and really as a sort of universal uh, sort of, you know, pointers or bullet points for us to understand and navigate the whole of Quran more generally speaking. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala presents stories within his holy book in order to offer us lessons. That's really the only objective. It's not for the purpose of entertainment, but rather it's to offer us a little bit of guidance, a little bit of inspiration, because at the end of the day, we're inclined toward knowing, toward learning, toward appreciating stories. From a very young age, we're taught fables, we're taught anecdotes. Our parents, our grandparents, those around us are consistently preaching to us via stories because it's that much easier for us to stay connected to things. And God says in the whole Quran, لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي قَسَسِهِمْ إِبْرَةٌ لِأُولِي الْأَنْبَاقِ That surely within this book are stories for those who reflect. Why do we like something as, you know, emotional and as telling as the day of Ashura. We love to you know, demonstrate our emotion when it comes toward the tragedy of Karbara because it's a really beautiful story. It's, if, if, if it was just an episode that took place and we didn't have the details that we have toward explaining it and narrating it in the way that we do, it would not be as telling, it would not be as impactful as we see within our communities today. But because we're able to extract so many a lesson and so many layers from those lessons as well, we're able to, again, feel that much more inclined to them. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us stories. And within these stories, like we know, he does not provide us all of the details. But rather, he only gives us snippets or glimpses, that which we can benefit from. If God does not mention it, and if his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, did not mention it in the commentary of these verses, then at the end of the day, it's not that important. When you take a look, for instance, at you know, the story of Ibrahim and Ismail and the sacrifice, for instance, we're not so concerned about you know, what Ibrahim wore when he went to perform the sacrifice of his son Ismail. Nor are we so concerned, for instance, with, I don't know, uh, what type of wood or how long it took for Prophet Nuh salam, to build his ark. Or about how tall the staff of Moses was. Again, because these things are not important in the big picture of things. But rather, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not speak out of sort of coincidence, but he only speaks to offer us guidance. 
And when he says something, again, it's just not out of thin air, but there is a deep and trusted wisdom within them, within those words, for us to extract. And again, stories, those specially and exclusively presented by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, have that much more opportunity to offer us that guidance that we're seeking. So that's where we're going to spend a lot of time reading and pondering upon some of these ayat, upon some of these verses. Because again, the story has a lesson. There's a wisdom behind it. So we have to find that wisdom. And we have to dig deep down sometimes in order to extract the lesson that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to demonstrate to us. So let's go to verse number 17 for those of you who are following. Chapter 68 of the whole of Quran, Surah Al-Qalam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, إِنَّ بَلَوْنَاهُمْ كَمَا بَلَوْنَا أَصْحَابَ الْجَنَّةِ إِذْ أَقْسِمُوا لَيَسْرِمُنَّهَا مُسْبِهِينَ He states, indeed we have tested them just as we have tested the people of the garden. First of all, when God mentions we have tested them, who is he speaking to? He's talking to the community of the Prophet of God, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We have tested them, the people of Mecca. Because again, like we mentioned, that this particular chapter is revealed within the holy city of Mecca. And those early uh, years in the lifetime of the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, were filled with difficulties, were filled with trials. And amongst the things that God most wanted to determine, and that he seeks to determine from anyone from amongst his creation, is to see our sincerity, whether or not we are grateful or not. Imma shakiran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us and laid it out quite directly, quite obviously virtually, to those who reflect and to those who contemplate that this world is going to be filled with some difficulty. It's going to you know, be comprised, it's intrinsic to its reality that there are challenges and obstacles that must be endured. We have tried them in the same way that we have tried the people of the garden. Who are the people of the garden? Our hadith, they give us a little bit of insight into this very small family. According to different commentators of the whole of Quran, that this particular episode over these next set of verses either takes place in a small village in Yemen or according to other commentators in Ethiopia. Nonetheless, it's not important uh, specifically where this event took place. Again, what's important is that there was a group of people who were in charge of this large farmland, this large garden that was growing a great deal of crops. And this particular family was fairly well off due to the crops that they were uh, cultivating and then selling and distributing toward their local community. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he gives us a little bit of insight in regards to the episode, but we're taught within our traditions, the ahadith of the Prophet and his family, alayhi salam, a little bit more context that can really drive the uniqueness of the lesson that we can derive home for us. There was an elderly man who had several sons. And again, this elderly man had been fairly well off and he attributed all of his financial success from this garden of his, from this farmland, from this fertile land of his, due to the fact that every morning during the good seasons where crops were you know, being cultivated and they were growing very well, that every morning he would wake up early and he would distribute some of the crops toward the local poor in his community at no cost. As an act of charity, every morning he would wake up very early and those locally within the community who are not so financially well off, who are looking for food, who are looking for drink, who are looking for some sense of livelihood, they would know how generous that this elderly man was. And so they would come out there early, prior to the time of dawn, ready for them to get some fruits, take some vegetables back home to their family. What happens is that a couple of years later, that the elderly man, the father, he passes away. And that his children... Now they inherit this massive farmland and they inherit all of these crops. But from their perspective, they also inherit the burden of distributing these fruits and vegetables to the impoverished within their community. And they don't want to have it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 
tells us what happens to them within the whole of Quran. Inna balawnahum kama balawna ashab al-jannati yadaqsamu la yasrimunnaha musfiheen. Indeed, we have tested them, the people of Mecca, in the same way that we tested the people of the garden, this group of children. When they vowed they would gather its fruit at dawn, what happens? Their father passes away, it's spring season, crops are starting to grow really well, and they begin to expect all of those poor folks from within their community to come and settle outside at dawn so that they would have to give out of their fruits and vegetables. But in order to increase their profits, they were thinking about money, of course, before anything else. They're thinking about their love of this world before any value or any ethic or any morality, like we tend to do when I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive me before anyone else. They gathered amongst themselves and they said, let's wake up even earlier than we expect these poor folks from within our community to come and let's gather together all of the crops and hide them. So they're going to walk by the farm and they're going to see that there's no fruits and vegetables growing this year. Maybe they'll think that the ground, we did not fertilize it appropriately or whatever, right? So that morning they woke up extra early and they began to commit toward gathering all of these fruits and vegetables and placing them on the side prior to the time of dawn. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, وَلَا يَسْتَثْنُونَ And they did not make any exception. It could be understood in many different ways. One could be that they did not remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or on the flip side, means that they made sure to pick up every single fruit and vegetable, right? فَطَافَ عَلَيْهَا طَائِفٌ مِّنْ رَبِّكَ وَهُمْ نَائِمُونَ Verse number 19. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, Then a visitation from your Lord took place on that garden, on that fertile farm. While they were asleep, a couple of things that we can extract from this lesson or from this particular verse. Number one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that we visited it. Meaning what? That rizq and sustenance, it comes from Rabbil Alami. It comes from the Lord of the worlds. Alhamdulillah, alladhi razaqani. Oh Allah, we say in a famous dua and famous supplication, Oh Allah, all thanks and all praise is due to you. For you are the one who sustains and not the people. If my sustenance, my wealth, my health, my life was in the hands of my manager, my boss, my work, at the end of the day, I'm going to die tomorrow and the only thing they're going to be concerned about is filling my position. Week, two weeks, they may grieve. They may recollect the tragedy, but everyone moves on. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he loves his creation. And he cares about his creation. Thus he sustains us in the way that he does. And we entrust our affairs to him because at the end of the day, it's all in his hands, Azawajah. فَطَافَ عَلَيْهَا طَائِفٌ مِّنْ رَبِّكَ وَهُمْ نَائِمُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and we perform the visitation to that fertile land. While they were sleeping. We mentioned earlier that when God mentions any particular detail within the whole of Quran, Again, it's not meant to just be something in passing, but it's important for us to think about it. Why does God say while they were sleeping? Normally when someone sleeps, they you know, assume that everything is going to be fine the next morning. When we sleep, we sleep comfortably for the majority of people. We sleep comfortably, especially when we've guilted ourselves toward believing that we're doing everything right. Of course, when we commit a crime, when we commit an act of transgression, the believer is difficult for them to sleep. When they're going through some hardship, they turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in dua and in supplication and so on. But for this group of individuals, they slept comfortably because they had a plan, again, to seek toward cheating the system. Or in other words, cheating Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this case. Thus God says, فَطَافَ عَلَيْهَا طَائِفٌ مِّنْ رَبِّكَ وَهُمْ نَائِمُونَ That there was a visitation from their Lord while they were asleep, while they were in comfort, while they were under the assumption that they had deceived Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again, remember we said that their father, he had attributed all of his financial economic success solely to the fact that he was someone who distributed to the poor, who cared for others. فَأَسْبَهَتْ كَسَّرِيمٌ and, and by dawn, that that entire field was 
filled with sand. It was entirely plucked. Meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had destroyed all of those crops, all of those fruits and vegetables. Fatanado musbihin. And in the morning they woke one another up, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. And they called upon one another. Let's wake up early. Let's get up. Let's make sure that we get all those crops. Again, they began to make their plans, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had already planned. And before we get into the next set of verses, let me conclude with this point. Inshallah, we'll continue this next week. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was determining and seeking from amongst them who was going to have a good intention. It could have been such that that elderly man, their father, who eventually passed down this garden to his family members, to his children, had some bad years when he was unable to distribute the amount or the worth. But out of the grace and out of the kindness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, due to the intention and due to the sincerity of that elderly man who had passed away some years earlier, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even sustained his children at least through this period. And it's important for us to consistently be in a state of self-account, in particular to check our intentions. Where are our intentions lie? Or where do they lie in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Are we striving to be where we need to be? Are we already there? What are the steps that we need to take to purify again the state? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala plans and we might plan. But it's important that when we work for God to know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will support us in our efforts and in our initiatives. But when we seek toward deceiving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we think about our nafs, we think about ourselves, prior to our thinking about those who are less fortunate, prior to our thinking about basic humanity and morality, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will strip away this dunya and the akhara as well. This is a custom that we learn from amongst the teachings of the whole of Quran, from amongst the teachings of the Prophet and his family, alayhim salatu wasalam. If we have learned anything over this last year and a half or so, it's that we have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow. And thus it's so important for us to remain centered consistently, remembering that this life is transient and it's passing. But if where our intentions are firm and where, where we're sincere and where we're consistently in a state of self-account, and placing God at the center and as our access in the course of our lives, inshallah ta'ala will find success in this world and the next. We'll continue our commentary and this particular anecdote of the people of the garden next week, next Thursday evening, inshallah ta'ala. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahumma ala Sayyidina wa Nabiyina Muhammad wa ala al-Tayyibin al-Tahirin. Thank you all for joining. Inshallah, we'll see you all next week. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. If you would like to listen to more, please donate to www.icnyu.org slash donate. For more of our virtual programs, go to www.icnyu.org slash classes. If you have any questions, email us at info at icnyu.org.